Okay, welcome back into the last episode of One Take, brought to you by the TAB. If you are going to have a punt, please do so responsibly and do it with our mates at the TAB. Uh, Cam will love that. Plug in a sponsor. There you Absolutely. go, mate. Uh, and it wouldn't be the final episode without getting uh, the man behind a lot of the success here, even though he won't like me saying it, but um, it is Warriors CEO, Cameron George. How are you, mate? I'm well. Why wouldn't you be? Yeah. This time of the year, usually we're... <laughs> On holidays over the last <laughs> few years, but um, no, it's exciting for everyone in the club. I think that's probably a good place to start, mate, because I wanted to speak about, um, you, we, you obviously just held a bit of a staff meeting downstairs and kind of addressed the fact that, um, you know, this is a time to celebrate, but there's still work to do. I guess that probably hasn't been a message in your tenure that you've given too much, but um, how has it, how's it been? Like, we will get to the year in, in general, but the feeling in this organisation at the moment, beyond just football, we'll get to the team. How's the feeling around uh, around camp, mate? Yeah, look, it's exciting. It's it's good. I, I I personally just love the fact everyone gets to celebrate their hard work. You know, too often, too much. You put your head down and you forget where you're at, and you don't nor- normally get the results you seek. But um, look, on this occasion, right across the organisation, there have been so many people working their butts off this year because we've had to really change up a number of things to reset the whole club and we've got the best staff right across the board working hard and and it's just exciting for me to see them get the benefit of their hard work which is you know two games away from a grand final and they're seeing what it's doing for a country they're seeing what it's doing globally with our fan base and that's because everyone's thought about you know their work and planned and execute and just really happy for them. Let's talk about this fan base because they're maniacs. I don't know. Um, look, bandwagon, call them what you want. Mm. They have come from everywhere, um, probably due to the great marketing team behind the camera there, but um, partly with the football department as well. Bro, how has it been for you um, as a CEO of this organisation to – I know you see it, we all see it and hear it, but to actually feel that sort of groundswell of support that has got behind these boys, you must be incredibly proud of that. Yeah, look, it, it's um, – It's you unprecedented know, You don't have to this, go too far back country. to um, – you know, understand the grenades that were thrown at the footy club and mm. and rightly so in some instances. But, um, you know, underneath all of that, there was a lot of planning and work that was going on, but we couldn't execute it because of COVID and the like. Mm. So um, to now see the fans see it, understand it, and be able to enjoy it is unreal. And, and, and just how far that spread is, you know, whether they're a one day or a two day, I don't, I, I don't care. It, the fact <laughs> is everyone's talking about this great footy club. Everyone's enjoying the ride and you just want to amplify it even more. And they're there. They're, you know, we've got ambassadors everywhere, you know, around the world. And um, it's been quite amazing to see, you know, other clubs try and take the piss out of us because we are succeeding in that area and yeah. they don't like it. And, you know, it's our turn to be in the sand pit and play with all the toys and kick them out. So, um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Let's go back um, and we'll kind of start at the beginning and, and finish with, with the current day. But what did the club look like, Cam, when sort of your tenure started versus what it looks like now? I say that with respect to the people and yeah. the place position was in at the time, but what sort of differences or similarities, how has it changed um, in your time? Mate? Nah, it's chalk and cheese, mate. Like <laughs> yeah. it's... When I started, um, what year was that, by the way? Uh, two thousand and the end of two thousand and seventeen. The day yeah. I started, Eric put it on the market. Yeah. So we're trying to run a business while it was for sale. We're trying to win footy games while it was for sale. We had potential buyers in the papers trying to sell themselves as being the best person to change and fix the club and so on. And once all that settled down and we got into our new ownership model, then we had another change and Robbo become our sole owner. Um, we haven't looked back, yeah. to be honest. We needed that stability. We hadn't had it, and we weren't getting it because of the you know the way the media circus was around the sale of the club. And when you don't have that stability in any walk of your life, um, it's hard to it's hard to get momentum, and it's hard to you know try and achieve success. And in a high pressured environment like this, you know we had everyone looking at us, asking questions, not knowing the answers, and um, our players were wanting to leave because there was no future, no stability, um, where you fast forward to where we're at now, well and truly five years down the track after a global pandemic, Mm -hmm. all of that stuff, I finally feel the club has the best people working in every role. Mm -hmm. And what that's created now is a commitment and a passion and stability like we've never had before. And we just, it's the only way you can get success is through your people. 
Let's talk about the footy because you, you, you come in, you mentioned um, in those early years sort of the <clears> instability <throat> around the club. You finally kind of get things relatively on track between yourself and Robbo and appointing the people you want in the right positions and then COVID hits. Yeah. Um, and I know we are working on things in the background around how we're going to properly tell that story because I think there's still so much for that period to be told from a club perspective. But when you look back on it now – I don't think fans or um, or anyone can kind of fully appreciate what this organisation and our players went through. How do you look back on that time now, mate? Oh, just it's mind blowing. It's when you're in it, I suppose it's hard to comprehend. But now well, you can. When you're in it, you're just surviving. That's yeah. all. That was your whole mandate was to survive, and that and was your focus. That was our focus, and and I remember the first day it hit, uh, no one knew where it was going and how long it was going to be around and all this sort of thing. And I remember we put everybody in the organisation on. Roughly around five hundred bucks a week. Mm. Head coach, myself, everyone. Wow! And everyone agreed to it because we didn't want to lose anyone. We didn't want to put people off. Yeah. Um. You know, there's a couple of little restructures, but you know that 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 happened. But ninety eight percent of people we kept on, and that was that was our clear sort of focus was to try and keep the group together. And then you know, it just went like. Just spiraled, spiraled out of control after that. And because of how fast things were moving, did you kind of have time to think? You know, because I, I know I know you well enough now to know that you like to have a plan moving forward. Um, that was a time when you couldn't plan. Mm. How did you find it as a CEO to be in that? You could no longer be proactive in your own business. You had to be yeah, yeah. <laughs> reactive. How was that for you personally, nah, it mate? Was, it was pretty tough. Um, because I wasn't getting the information from the NRL as frequently and as often as I wanted to sort of then relay that to the 80 staff and players that were wanting to know where they were going to be in, their, you know, in the next year. Yeah. So that was extremely frustrating and I, I let my frustrations go at the NRL at one day and one stage and ultimately that, you know, I probably aided in the fact that, you know, there's some um, – CEOs moved on and, and the likes over there because we just yeah. weren't getting the respect or anything like that. And all of my focus was trying to get the families of the players and the players and the staff and their families looked after with a plan. And it was just difficult. And I don't know how many Zoom calls on that we made, but like from start to finish before we got going again, it, it was just a horrendous period to try and um, keep everyone on the same page and Anyway, we got there through good people, and yeah. but it was just like wrestling smoke. You just couldn't get control of it. And, um, well, while all that's going on, mate, like you said before at the start, you're also trying to win football games. Where did that rank on your list of nah, priorities? Because, sure. I, I mean, you had – I don't play footy again. <laughs> yeah. like, it was just like – there was so many <laughs> – one week it was footy, and the next week it was – where are we going to stay? Trying to survive the business. And the week Quarantine. after was that, uh, how do we get <laughs> the players back into the competition that – yeah, Peter Valani just come out and announced, <laughs> and um, you know, then to try and get into the country from New Zealand, like you can't just get on a plane and fly in a global pandemic. Um, a, we had to get uh, permission from the federal government of Australia, and then we had to get permission from the state government oh, of God. New South Wales. To I'm come exhausted into their already. State. <laughs> and then we had to find somewhere to live yeah. and train and quarantine. And um, you know, one of the, the greatest yarns of it was that. We were booked at a place at Lennox Head and, and the state government backed out on us at the last minute and they said, well, look, you can still come to Australia and into New South Wales, but you need to get your own private training facility. But that facility's got to be where you can land a jet from New Zealand into New South <laughs> Wales and you've got to be quarantined there. So we've got to have a plan for all this sort of thing. And Plenty of those story, getting around, sure. I'm sure. <laughs> where do you fly a jet in from New Zealand to land in regional New South Wales with a training ground and accommodation and so on? And thankfully, <laughs> uh, I lived in Tamworth for a while and a mate of mine's a local member for parliament and he, he reached out to me and said if he could help. And ironically, I said, you can. So 11 o'clock at night, we're I need a runway. Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> yeah. And um, he was so supportive of us coming and – we got permission to fly an international flight into regional New South Wales. <laughs> we had to take a lot of bags off the plane because the weight couldn't uh, – we couldn't have that much weight on yeah. to land at the airport. Then we got shipped into a club that I used to play footy at and the boys stayed there. They trained there and they weren't allowed to leave there for two weeks. It was just an absolute mess and that's <sighs> one of a million stories. But yeah, yeah. this goes to show you how quick it was moving. And um, and I guess for fans, as, for fans as well, Cam, they, <clears throat> all they were seeing was – like a, an NRL announcement that the comp's coming back and the Warriors are going to be based in Tamworth. So then to know that there's a lot of <laughs> layers to just getting there, like f landing a jet and, I mean, you're trying to 
Put yeah, out put out the, fires on top of and fires. Then the families couldn't go. Yeah. They said they'll be allowed to go a month later. Then they got they weren't allowed to go a month later. So that caused how was how was that, mate? Because I can remember I was a, a still a journalist at the time covering the club, and I remember the iconic photo of might have been Bleary, um, his young fella Taika yeah. um, trying airport. to at the airport. Like that nah, must have just was, been brutal for you to to watch the boys go through. Well, that. it was worse a month later because the boys only left on the basis that their families were coming a month later. Mm. They were told when they left that their families wouldn't be allowed to come. Yeah. They wouldn't have gone. Yeah. And then a month later, we get the phone call. The government won't let the families into Australia unless they had an Australian passport. How did you have that conversation no, with Yeah, it was pretty difficult. Hence, mm. five or six players come home. And yeah. that was our commitment as a footy club that if your families can't come, you know, boys, the door's open, you can come home. Yeah. So a few of them come home, but it was devastating at that point. That was... That was a pretty low period because the boys felt helpless. They felt used. They felt rightly so. Yeah. Oh, mate, they were angry as. And is that one of the hardest? I felt embarrassed. Is that one of the hardest conversations you've had to have with the playing group in your tenure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I zoomed them, and they're all sitting in a lounge room at, at oh, Terrigal, and and I'm on a TV, and <laughs> they're all looking at me, and um, I'm telling them their their families aren't allowed into Australia unless they've got an Australian passport. So some guys were like, well. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Mine's, uh, my wife has, where a majority of them couldn't uh, <laughs> comprehend it because they were promised that their families were coming, and um, oh, bro. that's when it, it, it turned pretty low at that point. I reckon um, for that particular year, and then there was a few other low points, but that one where the families weren't allowed. But eventually, we got them in there. Yeah, some months later, which is good. Look, that we could we could stay on that topic, you know, for yeah. for another hour. We could do a whole podcast on that. But let's fast forward. Um, two thousand and twenty three, and it's the, you know, the homecoming happened, and it was all a big celebration. You come into two thousand twenty three. You got a new head coach. Uh, you got a couple of a uh, couple of wizards in the room, new staff members. Um, but how it is when you came into this season? Um, I know we were all optimistic and hopeful and confident. Has this team exceeded even your expectations of kind of what you thought was capable this year? I, yeah, I think it'd be fair to say yes. Mm. Um, I, I, I've genuinely felt we would improve just organically by being home. Yeah, natural improvement. Um, I think the thing I loved about going into this year is that um, the reset of the club. We had an opportunity to really reset it with a new head coach. Um, Finding our identity again, making those you know, making that very clear. But if you have a look at all the new players we brought into the club, you know, um, they've all got the same traits. Mm. They're all competitors. They're all winners. They're all they, they hate losing in any anything, let alone footy. Uh, they're fit, um, and they're passionate about coming over here and helping our footy club become really good. And you marry that up with a new coach who was full of energy and he, he was passionate about Still New is. Zealand <laughs> and, and our footy club. And yeah. then you bring them together with the, you know, with the guys that we had stay on at our footy club after COVID and they've just gelled so well. So what we've seen then is a, a group really refocused on going after the, the mm. purpose and the cause of what we're here to do. And um, it's just, it's, it's a real pleasure to sit back and watch when you put good people together, what they can achieve. And uh, it's another good sign to us all that if the minute you have a bad egg in your joint, it, it, mm. it can just dispel good culture. And um, it's just they played above their weight in a lot of instances, but mm. it hasn't been so surprising. But yeah. to finish in the top four, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and the reality is we're probably two or three games we should have won. Mm. We might have been up there and won two. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, the, they have, but I'm really, uh, really not surprised. Yeah. You touched on a couple of points there I want to circle back to. First of all, the re the new recruits, um, complementing obviously the stable of senior players, Torhu, Sean, that we already had at this club. But there was a lot of, um, I don't want to say criticism, but uh, pundits and the likes sort of turning their eyebrow up at the likes of Chans, Marata, Mechi, Walks, these guys who a lot of people thought were, you know, Solid first graders, but perhaps, um, and the boys won't like me saying journeymen, but guys that would kind of fill a hole. And they've all, I mean, they've arguably been, you know, five of our best fucking seven or eight players this year. How did you know that um, those were the right guys for this organisation? Was it simply uh, conversations with you and Cappy, or was it? Uh, was it? No, a lot of a lot of them, 
a lot of them were a long time ago. Like yeah. we signed Lukey Metcalf, Mitch Barnett, Murata, like over twelve months ago. Right. Um, but you look at young Luke; he's on the way up. You know, and um, you want to talk about a guy who's always smiling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's loving life. And um, you look at Murata; like he's an ex warrior. Yeah, went to Sydney. And excelled at a really good footy club and played in the grand final last year, played finals. Mitch Barnett, just a tough bastard, you know, and, and just wants to win. And mm. we needed that in the pack with Adam yeah. um, to, to help with Jazz and all those boys. They were carrying a lot of yep. burden in that regard. And Dylan Walker, he's a premiership winner and he's value, you know, like he can play anywhere as we've seen. And um, he's, he's around the group just a terrific clubman. Yeah. And we've done our homework on that, and he, he, he was exactly what we needed. And um, Charns, well, mate, <laughs> Charns only left this club because he was behind Rog, Dave yeah. Fusatua, Kenny Mamalo at the time. Yeah. And he went for a better opportunity, and he got it. He played in the grand final in 2019. Mm. Now, whatever happened at Canberra happened. Mm. And then when Reese Walsh, you know, said he wanted to stay home in Australia – I said, well, you're not going until I get a find a replacement. That's yeah. it. That was a deal. And we all agreed on that. And Chance's name came up within, you know, the space of a day. Yeah. And it was a no-brainer. We had a guy that wanted to come back to the club and wanted to lead this club to where it hasn't been before. And, and that was enough for you. the quality yeah. of people we've got marrying up with our our really good fellas that were here. So yeah. just, you know, and it's, again, it just go back to people. They're good people. Yeah, Chance might be one of the best people you'll ever meet in life, let alone football. <laughs> um, speaking of good people, we've we've had to get to him. I've tried to take as long as possible, but uh, Webby, Andrew Webster, yeah. <laughs> um, the PR machine. Yeah, the PR machine. I used to know he loves Webby it when he got a haircut once every six months. Yeah, right. Now he gets one every. Week. Oh, he loves it. Loves every it. week. <laughs> yeah, he absolutely loved it. He'll love that we're talking about him too. Um, Look, he's been getting a lot of praise, and rightfully so. He's come in here along with the Stacey Jones, Morgs, and Rich, Richie Agar, and uh, clearly there's been a culture shift, which you'll probably be able to speak to a lot better than me. All the parts that you've mentioned in this episode here, um, having the right people, being back home, all that sort of stuff goes into it. But what on Webby himself has impressed you most this year? Kind of two-part question. What have you enjoyed watching in terms of his development this year as a, as a head coach? Um, I've enjoyed watching him not change. Yeah. You know, the Webby that I went after at the time of looking for a coach is a Webby that's sitting downstairs now. Having a um, stake. Two weeks from the grand final. <laughs> yeah. You know, he hasn't changed, and that's the greatest attribute he can have is don't try and be someone else you're mm -hmm. not. And we don't want him to change one bit. Um, look, he, he's he's a smart footy coach. He, he relates well to the players. He understands how the players want to – want their messages. Um, he keeps it pretty simple but effective and he's just a good all-around person that loves people. So mm. um, that environment down there is perfect for Webby and more so than Webby's perfect for it, yeah. for him, uh, for them. And um, Ivan Cleary, when I rang him and, you know, said I'm talking to Webby and, and so on, um, you know, Ivan said he's ready for a head coaching role, no problem. Yep. I won't bore you with that story. But the one thing he did st say to me that stood out um, is that Ivan knows our footy club better than most. Yeah. And he said not only is he ready for a head coaching role, he is absolutely ready to be the Warriors head coach mm. because he understood Webby's way of things and the way he does stuff and he understood the culture here at the Warriors. So – he he really believed that he was a perfect fit for us. And I think he would have said the opposite if he didn't think he was a perfect fit for us. So he I would have a said, lot of confidence yeah, for that. He would have said he can be a head coach, but maybe not the right guy for yeah, you. Yeah, correct. Well, that's, I mean, people keep on um, talking about buying into culture and all that sort of stuff. And Walks sat in that chair a couple of weeks ago and said the same thing. He said the way he came in and he said he's, he's picked up very quickly and Walks has been around some very successful coaches in his time. And he says the way – he doesn't talk to everyone the same. And I think that's probably part of coaching that you can speak to better than me that might be the hardest part is nailing your communication. Some of the young boys from different backgrounds need to be spoken to a different way than a – you know, Sean needs to be spoken different than Barney. Barney needs to be spoken yeah. different than, you know, Ali Leotoa, for example. Like, And Webby's kind of 
what Walks described as kind of the master of that. Um, how does that, when, when you're sitting there and, and you're watching him communicate with the boys, is, are you seeing him kind of evolve in that role or is it something that comes pretty natural to him? No, he's a, he's a naturally gifted communicator. Hmm. Like you can sense that from the minute you meet him right through every um, every time you see him in the media or otherwise. But in front of the group, he, he, he just he keeps it simple. Hmm. He doesn't overanalyze it. But he understands the key points and how to really communicate those um, in a manner in which these guys respond to really well. But his he's ability to carry out different conversations in different ways to suit you know that that person. Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's very evident that that's he's very capable of that, and um, you know the way he talks to walks, for instance, <laughs> is very different to the way he talks to Sean Johnson. I uh, think the way you talk, the way you. everyone talks to walks is different. Correct. Right? <laughs> the way he talks to you is very different. Too, yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, no, he's very good with me actually. I quite like it. Um, right. Well, let's. We've only got you for another couple of minutes, mate. I won't hold you up too long, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about that man, Sean Johnson. Um, Hopefully our future Dellium medal winner is what we're hoping for here and premiership hero. But Sean's roller coaster, you've probably been closer to that. Um, and I say roller coaster affectionately, his career yeah. at the Warriors. You've been closer to that than probably most people. What's it been like to watch Sean this year? Um, I guess just as a as a mate and as a colleague, but um also as a player. How have you how have you found his year, mate? Yeah. It's a replication of everything that's going on here. It's the happiness and the, the stability and the mm. the buying from everyone just shows what he's doing on the field, and he deserves it. Um, you know, if, if I look back and have one major regret in my time at the Warriors was in 2019 when Sean left. Um, I could have handled that so much better, and um, when the opportunity for him to come back was happening, um, the first time I picked up the phone, I rang Sean yeah. and said, I want to clear the deck, put my hand up. And straight away, like, he just showed what a professional he is. And, mate, we, I've just loved seeing him get to where he's got to now. If he doesn't win the Dallium, it's a it's a joke if he <laughs> yeah. doesn't win that. Um, but he struggled last year, hmm. but he didn't sign with the Warriors to be separated from his family. He wanted to come home. But once we got through last year and just seen him just – Propelled to where he's got to now is just every fan should be smiling because that's that's how, that's what we want. You know, he's the most special human, hmm. and he's and mate, he's matured really well. He's a professional. He's he's just a pleasure to be around, and um, you know, so yeah, we've we've been through a fair bit, <laughs> and uh, I'm just so happy for him and his family. Yeah. All right, mate. Well, um, I was going to get to a bit of up the wires chat, but we are running out of time. So just lastly, right before we came on here. Another sellout. Um, it's, yeah. It seems to be a bit of a theme this year. It is our first home final since 2008, Cam. So firstly, congratulations to you and and, and your team for that. Um, but, mate, to be going through the sellout after sellout after sellout, and now with everything on the line, we get a home final. Um, I guess it's your opportunity to just thank the fans or give your message. But how's that been throughout this year? And then how pumped are you for Saturday, mate? Yeah, I was so <laughs> pumped for Saturday. You're right. Um, but, you know, for, the, for our fans, it's – this club is owned by Robbo. Yeah. But even he says it, and I believe in it so much, that this club is a New Zealand, it's the Kiwis club. Mm. It's every person that's associated with this country, this is your rugby league club, and we just want to make them proud. And um, that's why I love everyone talking about it because I feel like they're proud. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we can go and lift that trophy in the next few weeks. If we don't, we don't. We move on. We go after it again. But – Everything about our footy clubs about what's right for our fans, and we just love them dearly. And um, yeah, just enjoy the next week or two. There we go. All right, guys, that is one take brought to you by the TAB Cam, mate. We really appreciate you. I've been trying to get you on all year. Talk to the last episode. Uh, you're a hard man to pin down, but I really appreciate you coming on, mate. And uh, yeah, up the wire, though. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Thank you.